back to the Bookends YouTube channel. I'm James McGowan. I'm Jessica Fast. And today we have Naomi Davis with us. Hey! Cue the applause in the background. <laughs> <laughs> one of those buttons that just has the applause and like, ooh. A laugh track. We got one of those. Yeah. So we can make jokes and people will actually laugh. Yeah. A laugh track will be nice. <laughs> Live audience. Um, so if you have been following along with the Bookends channel, you know that we've invited the Bookends team on for some conversations with Jessica and I. Um, and today we've got a bunch of great questions lined up for you, Naomi. Um, awesome. So we can just dive right in. Why don't you introduce yourself to the channel first? I know you've been on before, but it's still a nice quick introduction. I'm not like on a treadmill this time or <laughs> embarrassing myself or anything. So yeah, that's good. Yeah. Hey, I'm Naomi Davis, literary agent with Bookends. And I'm so happy to be here to talk about the kinds of stuff I represent, who I am as a creative person, and any other questions that James and Jessica have for me. Yeah. So well, I'm um, not to embarrass you. We will not. That's all right. A little bit of embarrassing is fine. We usually do such a good job on ourselves that we don't need to embarrass right. anyone else. <laughs> the comic appeal is like... <laughs> big selling point for the YouTube channel. Yeah. It really is. Your video when you were on the treadmill still is a hit. And even the one where you were roasting your first draft, people still- Oh, that's pretty great. That I get a... emails about comments on that one all the time. Like, wow, that's probably the most evergreen video on the channel. <laughs> I, had, I had somebody at a conference be like, you know, you should not have lit it on fire. You should have saved it. You're going to care about that when you're my age. And I was like, <laughs> Don't miss it. <laughs> Don't ever want to read it again. So <laughs> immortalize it on YouTube at least. <laughs> it's perfect. Well, we've got a bunch of great questions. So let's just dive in with probably the most general first one. So you've been with Bookends for a few years now. So what has it been like as your list has grown and changed in that time? I think I'm extremely fortunate to be at Bookends. Jessica, you know, I tell you all the time how happy I am to to be with such a, a supportive company. You know, all of the agents at Bookends are so eager to share their expertise with each other, and we really all form a fantastic team environment, kind of working toward everybody's success. And that's that was new for me when I came to Bookends. Like I was used to being very independent as an agent, um, and it's just such a healthier environment for me as a person. Um, I think my list has really changed because when I came to bookends, you know, picture books was something that I was a little bit interested in, but didn't necessarily think I'd like be very good at. And it's become one of my, one of my best categories. So I'm really excited to have continued to grow my list in science fiction and fantasy, in adult romance, YA and middle grade, and then to take up picture books as a challenge that I've really enjoyed. It's really been fun for me to watch you and all the other agents sort of find their path and also how that path changes, especially from when you started or, you know, the preconceived notion of this is what I do and this is what I know and learning from everybody else to really discover that you have talents in places you didn't know that you had. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I've raised three kids now, and they're all teenagers, almost teenagers or teenagers. And so I think when I came into this, I was like, I don't want to read another picture book. All I've been doing is reading picture books for the last decade. And, and that gave me a great insight into things that don't exist in the market yet that I would like to see exist in the market. Um, and having children who are on the neurodiverse and rainbow spectrum has really um, showed me that there's, there's, there are certain lacking categories in picture books that I'm really happy to help fill with incredibly talented authors. Yeah, it's fun to watch too. But also, that's something that you have, if we can just um, brag about you for a while, that's something that you have adamantly and compassionately, like, focused on growing those holes in the picture book market. And I think you've done it so well, and your list obviously reflects that. But what do you look for? Like, how do you pick the projects you want to work on in that space? Well, thank you for saying that. You know, it's it's something I really care about. Um, and I, I I feel that um, you know, and, and this is such like a lame agency answer, but you know the right thing when you see it and, and you know when something makes you feel something that no other book has made you feel before uh, or no other book in that category has made you feel before. Um, you know, one of my, my biggest goals as an agent, as, as for many of us, is to champion underrepresented voices. And I think in the space of representing autistic authors and neurodiverse creators, you know, I've really found um, that there's, there's, a passion and a connection to the material that's hard to find from a perspective that's not an own voices perspective. So I'm, I'm really happy to continue bringing on authors from all kinds of backgrounds. 
Well, and I think what, when you were talking sort of came to me is that building a list in an area that you hadn't necessarily intended to go meant that you went into it with almost a mission. Like you were looking for a, such a specific kind of book because your whole list wasn't dependent on that. So you were really able to build up those voices because you weren't building a full list, which you now have. And yeah, have a full list, but that wasn't your original intent. It was very much almost like a mission that you had when you started into it. Yeah, and I think I went into it with no expectation of what I would find either. You know, I went into it with a very, very open mind in terms of, you know, there, there are certain voices that I would really like to hear more from, but I don't yet know what those voices are going to tell me or what they're going to teach me. And going in with that open mind really allowed me to expand my list in a really organic way. I'm going to jump in with the next question if James is okay with it. Yeah, because please do. I don't know if Naomi really knew this when... <laughs> she came into bookends but one of the reasons that i brought naomi on or um, was so excited to bring naomi on is that i had always wanted to have a science fiction fantasy list so um but i have and had and will continue to have no abilities to build that list myself <laughs> So when I brought Naomi on, it was really with the intent that I wanted somebody who could really do that. And um, you have done that. So what was it like to build <laughs> genre out of nothing? We didn't have any science fiction and fantasy when you came on. Yeah, and I, I think that's actually, like, I, I knew that I wanted to move harder towards science fiction and fantasy too because it's my first love as a reader i mean i i get sucked into so many science fiction and fantasy manuscripts that if i represented them all it's all i would do um so i i mean i don't think i realized that bookends was lacking in that area and i shouldn't say lacking i don't think i realized that bookends was was still trying to grow in that area um and it was it was really exciting um, to see all the enthusiasm from the other agents as I started to, you know, sell titles in that space. Um, it's, Bookends represents so many different titles in so many different categories that I think it's really great we've been able to expand in this direction and I'm just so happy to be a part of it. Well, and in many ways, you were introducing editors to bookends. Well, there are some editors certainly that cross over. A lot of the editors you work with only do science fiction and fantasy and may not really have known of bookends when you got started. So in some ways you were ground zero. And what was that like? And did you run into any obstacles along the way? Yeah, I think science fiction and fantasy imprints are typically very specific. I mean, there's a couple that really cross over in terms of crossing over with romance or crossing over with, you know, thriller and crime. Um, but science fiction and fantasy imprints, often that's all they do. Um, and I think as I was expanding my contact list, it was a little bit scary. It was a little bit frightening to be like, hey, I'm just starting to push into this space and I hope I know what I'm talking about. And I think I do know what I'm talking about. My, my sales look like I know what I'm talking about, but I, I think there's always that fear when you're making new connections and trying to um, fit all the puzzle pieces together that make a book feel happen. So it's been really fun. Um, and I think that, you know, the science fiction and fantasy authors that I represent bring some really groundbreaking stuff um, to the table. And I'm very excited to see where readers think of the projects that are out right now and that are coming and nobody knows about yet because that's fun too. <laughs> yeah, and certainly now all the science fiction fantasy editors know you and who bookends is. So it's it's funny though yeah. because I think every writer experiences this too, but agents, especially as we're breaking into new things or meeting new people, it is peak time for imposter syndrome. <laughs> like, we don't know if we're doing it right. And and that's I think every agent will experience that. But eventually, you know, you keep doing it and you get more confident at it. So it's funny to hear that with your science fiction fantasy list being what it looks like now that you had those feelings in the beginning. I oh mean, yeah, I mean, it feels them, but. And I, I think whenever you're sending out a project that's really new or different, which, you know, in science fiction and fantasy, our benchmark for new and different is, you know, <laughs> there's so much you can do in right. science fiction and fantasy that doesn't even exist on this planet. So, um, you, you know, when you're sending something out in science fiction and fantasy, I might think it's the most amazing thing, but I'm still sending it to editors who might look at this and go, I, I, I don't know how to relate to this. I have no idea what this is supposed to mean. So, you know, when I get that call from the editor who just goes, what is this? I love it. 
you know, and I get to share all that excitement with the author. I mean, that's just, that's everything, especially something that was born out of such an imaginative space in science fiction and fantasy. It's, it's, I think a little bit, um, different than a more contemporary story that way. Agreed. Um, well, you are an incredibly creative person. You have so many different creative outlets, but what is it about, and if you want to speak about them, please do, but what is it about um, agenting that lets you fulfill that creative niche? And how do you be creative in this space? I think I'm a hyper-creative person. Like, I think creativity <laughs> plays into a little bit, plays into just about everything I do, you know, whether that's that's musical expression or whether it's writing or whether it's other forms of art or, you know, covering my body in tattoos, all of those things. Um, I think with agenting, there's, it's, it's a different part of my creative brain that gets engaged when I'm reading wow. submissions and looking at, you know, is this a project that brings back an experience in a book I've read before, or is this something that's introducing me to a totally new feeling or a totally new reaction or a totally new perspective on the world? So it kind of engages a different part of my creative brain. Um, and then of course, I love the side of my brain that's like business sense too, so it engages that as well. Well, I think that's what the agent creative brain is too, like the perfect mashup of business and creativity. Yeah, Jessica and I have talked a lot about how, you know, even in negotiating book deals, no two situations are the same and they all require different approaches. And I'm still sometimes like, I don't know what I'm doing, but it's a lot of fun to try and figure out how to navigate those waters. Yeah, there's no plan in this business. It's, it's always be ready to, you know, pivot every direction, not just one, every single direction at once. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun to try and like look at all the potential outcomes that could happen and how am I going to respond to every single one if it happens or if more than one happens at once. And it's, it's, I think it's hard when authors ask these questions like, what would you do if? It's like, I don't know, that depends on 9,000 other factors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jessica said something that I wrote down in my notebook. It's like on a little post-it, you make plans, publishing breaks plans every single time. Like it doesn't matter what you plan for, there's going to be some little tweak that's going Going to just completely make you shift gears. Yep. Well, I don't think one thing that I don't think people realize or authors realize is how creative negotiating is. Oh yeah. Uh, that when we are planning every single next step in the negotiation process, it's it's creative. Like it's a it's a different form of creativity for us. Yeah. Yeah. You have to find the the right reaction to each situation and try to anticipate what your reaction is going to trigger in the other party you're communicating with and all of that dancing around is is as you said it's not something that can be planned yeah well speaking of being a creative person as a writer yourself how does that inform and shape the way you agent and the things that you're looking for um i think the strongest way that my experience as a writer shapes my agenting experience is just that I know as an incredibly insecure writer who suffers from imposter syndrome all the time, you know, I know all of the anxiety-based questions that are going through a writer's head. You know, from the moment I request the manuscript to the moment I offer a presentation to we're negotiating the book deal to, you know, I have a question about my book cover, all of those steps of the way I'm able to sit in both seats. Um, and look at it in terms of how would I want my representative to handle this situation with me, especially if I was expressing some kind of anxiety or difficulty handling a situation. Um, you know, I'm an incredibly empathetic person as it is, um, and bringing that into each of my agent and client relationships and representing each client to their level of need is something that's really important to me. Yeah, I like that. And you are definitely probably the most empathetic person I know. It's crippling sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, I want to be mad at you, but I see what you mean. <laughs> um, so I think, like you said, you can kind of relate to all the anxieties of things. Probably the most anxiety-inducing <laughs> process a writer must um, partake in is querying. But you took oh. a very traditional route to finding your... So what um, tips and suggestions do you have for the average writer? That was a great segue. <laughs> it was a great segue. Good job. I'm terrible at segues. So every time there's a good one, I have to point it out. <laughs> Give you a round of applause. 
I think I think James needs a quote card that says that's a great segue. I just put it right here. I'm gonna crop that little praising of myself out, but I just every time I nail a segue, I have to point it out. If we ever sell merch, there will be a t-shirt that says that's, that's a great segue. segue. <laughs> this is James's catchphrase. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> On the heels of such a great segue. Yeah, I took a I took a traditional route to querying to um, find the perfect agent to represent my work. Um, and represented by Trisha Skinner at Fuse Literary Agency. Um, I mean, I sent out a lot of queries and I got a lot of rejections and I got a lot of this is not for me. And I got, you know, I had one agent who was who responded with something like, Do you even know what I represent? And I'm like, e yeah, but, but that just shows you how subjective things are that here I am, a science fiction and fantasy agent, trying to shop my science fiction and fantasy books, and I still get an agent who goes, I, this is not even close to a fit, and I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know. So, you know, I, I, have, I have a lot of respect for authors who are out there trying that even when they really hit the, miss the mark because I did it too. Um, and ultimately, you know, I chose Trisha because I knew her as a professional. We had sat on panels together as agents. Um, you know, she's a writer as well, a wonderful writer. And I, I knew that she was as passionate as I was about uh, striking that perfect balance between, you know, being a strong representative and being an empathetic agent who knows what a client is going through. And I really appreciated that she shared that with me. So I have a couple of questions. Sure. Do you feel that um, because you're an agent and you see both sides of it, um, that the rejection letters that you got from agents maybe didn't hurt as much? Or do you think it just doesn't matter because you were wearing writer hat and you still felt the same feelings any writer feels? Well, I'm often all up in James's inbox <laughs> with my anxieties. So I think he knows as well as I do that no, they stung just as much. I mean, it, it hurts just as much getting that no or sitting there going, I'm not going to get any offers at all. I should quit, you know, and, and having all of those insecurities and imposter syndrome. And still, you know, still when my books are in submission and I'm receiving those rejections from editors, you know, industry professionals, I know too, like that can really, really sting to feel like, oh, I, I missed the mark again. But as writers, we're way too close to our own material to see it objectively. We know that. And that's why we encourage writers to seek out critique partners and outside feedback, you know, and, and most importantly, why an agent shouldn't represent herself. Um, because we're, we're way too close to the material to be objective about it and to really see is the complete picture coming across on the page. I can't imagine representing yourself. That no, just, I I, I, I gave me anxiety just to you saying that. And my email uh, would be like, would you like to read this? It's okay if you say no. <laughs> So you you had the advantage of meeting Trisha and being on a panel with her and yeah. and sort of I guess seeing her at work in some way, but a lot of authors don't have that opportunity. They can't get to conferences, or right now there are no conferences. Um, although maybe that's better. Maybe there are more Zoom opportunities that people can get to. But I don't know. I digress. Anyway, what um, sort of recommendations or what kind of things do you feel like you did in your search for an agent that authors who don't have that opportunity to meet agents in person could emulate or how, you know, I think a lot of people will say, well, that's great. You met her in person. Of course, you knew she was right. I don't have that opportunity. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, asking lots of questions is really, really important. And, you know, there's kind of a prescribed list of questions that authors go through when we're offering representation and all of them are really really wonderful and important questions but there are other questions i think that that linger that authors sometimes don't feel like they should ask because nobody talks about asking those questions and those are often the ones that really matter you know um and one of the questions that one of the topics that i covered with trisha when we were talking about representation um you know was just where do you see this relationship going like where do you see what direction do you want us to go Ian, is this something where we're just going to try to chop this book and then see what happens from there? Do you have plans? Are there, are there expectations that you want me to fulfill? Like, what do you, where do you see this relationship going in the long term? Um, because I think it's easy for authors to get swept up in, oh, this agent loves my book, my book's going to sell, and then I'm going to be, you know, 
going to my movie premiere and, you know, getting swept up into all those fantasies. And it's our job to ground authors and make sure that they see their realistic picture. But there's so much more to it than that, you know, and, and for Trisha to be able to say to me, you know, if you're just needing to hash something out, get in touch with me, we can set up a call. Like that's how I agent too. Um, and striking that balance is really important. So ultimately, I just think that, you know, authors need to ask the questions that are on their mind um, and not leave them because then they'll they'll fester and more anxieties will brew and then there's not a good solid communicative base for that relationship. So um, I'm sorry James I'm totally asking all the questions suddenly but no, you keep giving fine. me more to ask Naomi. Um, so when you got that call and we're, I know I think you talked to a couple of different agents if I remember I correctly. Yeah. So when you were interviewing agents, you know, I think the hardest thing for authors to do in those situations is to switch the role that they've sort of been the, you know, they're the underdog. They feel they're the underdog the whole time they're querying. And now all of a sudden those calls come in and they need to be the one who's taking charge and having those t hard conversations and be bringing those up was that hard for you to do even though you're on both sides yeah i'm not gonna lie i was like profusely sweating through <laughs> all of my offer calls I, I was fortunate to get three offer calls um from agents and you know all professionals that i deeply deeply respect and i'm so grateful that they connected with the kind of books that i'm writing um but i was sweating buckets like i was not in a good headspace. <laughs> like I was, I was panicking. Um, like you can't even talk about it. No, and, and I think I think that it's the stakes feel so high at that moment, and you're like, you know, you what if I make the wrong choice? Like, what if this is a bad decision? What if this all burns down, and I'm really, really disappointed in the decision that I made? Um, and ultimately, you know, all of my conversations with agents were really, really great. Um, it came down to a matter of trust and the fact that when I was on the phone with Trisha, I wasn't as nervous and I felt more comfortable just in the connection and the relationship. And that, that ultimately made the decision for me was just my gut, my feelings, the fact that the agent put me at ease and really made me feel like I was in good, confident hands. And, and that's what made the difference for me. I think that's perfect. What, the way you said there that she made you feel comfortable is I think what everybody should be striving for. That's great. Yeah, and I think when I when I offer representation to clients, you know, I'll often tell them if you have other agents that you're looking at pursuing, you know, and other offers out there and those make you more comfortable, then, then I want you to go that direction too. Because ultimately, I'm not going to benefit from the relationship if the author is unhappy either. So I, if, if I really want a book, but the author chooses another agent, like I'm grateful that they made the choice they feel most confident in making and I'll always cheer from the sidelines. Yeah, I, I always feel the same way. Like, find the person that's right for you. I'm not right for everybody. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you and I were just talking about this. We're both going through intense month-long writer block. But I know for a fact that you just broke that in the most impressive way possible. Yeah. <laughs> I took a week off of work and I crushed so many words. Like, they are not in the right order. Like, I'm pretty sure they're all in the wrong order, but, but they're, they're there. <laughs> they exist. They exist. My document has a word count that doesn't make me want to cry. Um, makes me want to cry, though. <laughs> <laughs> picture books and novels. You know, yeah. you're like, that's so many picture books. <laughs> um, yeah, I... I I don't know that what I was experiencing was true writer's block, like the creative gears were still turning. What I didn't have was the bandwidth to sit down and actually detach from the real world and invest in a fantasy world. Um, and I think that has something to do with this pandemic. I don't feel like maybe that's a part of it. <laughs> um, just the world, just 2020. Just the world, just the world <laughs> 2020, so much going on um, that requires so much mental energy that I, I think a lot of people are going through writer's block or some form of creative block right now. Um, ultimately, I broke through it by looking at this week and realizing, okay, school is starting. So there are other adults, whether they're at home or at school, there are other adults who are somewhat responsible for some of my children's time. And just getting that pressure off made me feel like, okay, I can take some time for myself and I can really get into my group and do some work here. 
I'd like to point out that based on Slack, you really didn't take a week off. I didn't. Like, I'm so, so I'm every author who's like, well, that's great. I can't afford to take a week off. Let me tell you, if that's a week off for Naomi, um, then she is definitely working 24-7 when she's here. <laughs> it was a pretty awesome week off. Yeah. <laughs> a week yeah. off. <laughs> I, I, I'm such a workaholic though. Like I really struggle. We were just talking about this. Like I really struggle to put down my email and step away because I, I do love what I do so much that it's like, oh yeah, spend time with the husband or I can work, you know, and I'm on my <laughs> phone. Right. So it's a problem here at bookends in general. I feel, I feel like it's a good problem to have. Yeah. But I feel like I spend more time telling people to go away than I do trying to get them to come to work. <laughs> then, we go, then we go away and all the action happens. So That's <laughs> as I said, I am now permanently out of office all the time, as long as my inbox keeps hopping like it was. <laughs> yes, authors, if you ever notice the bookends seem shut down, it's because it's always um, a happy jinx that every time we do, we suddenly are busier than ever. Yeah, pretty great. Yep. Well, this was great. Thank you for joining us and answering all of our questions. I think all of our viewers will love to hear more from you. So we appreciate having you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Love it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any other questions for Naomi, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer them. Drop them in the comments and we will get you an answer. But we hope to see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.